Hey guys, welcome back. BGC Care here. We're back with season six, episode ten of our weekly P and Q and C and A and T videos. That stands for podcast questions, comments, answers, and talking. The P for podcast is because you can access this either on YouTube or on uh, most major podcast distributors. Uh, links in the description if you're on the YouTube video for how to access that. And uh, it seems unlikely that anybody found our podcast not from the YouTube channel. So if you want to watch it on YouTube, I'm sure you already know how to get at that content. Um, so I think we wanted to kind of have a little bit of discussion maybe from, from last episode, sort of a little bit of continuation. You wanted to wrap up some yeah. stuff? Yeah. Yeah, no, there's just, I mean, it always feels like we have way too much footage and too much time to talk about stuff, and it always ends up, like, at the end, we're squeezing stuff in at the mm. last minute, you know, like, just saying a bunch of stuff really fast just because we're, we're out of footage. So, yeah. one thing was, all right, so what's interesting to me, I just learned recently, do you know what a millennial is? Um, like, you know how there's Generation X and stuff? yeah, but not, like, specifically. So, I always thought that millennials were people who were uh, born in the the aughts uh 2000 or later well i knew that i know that's not true like i know that not to be true because there's like people that are considered millennials that are in like their like late 20s right early 30s? i think even 30s i yeah. think 30s because th i i looked this up the idea was that millennials were supposed to turn 18 become adults by the year 2000 so it's anybody mm. born as late as 1982 or is re sorry, not as late. Yeah, as recently as 1982. Oh, so they could be in their mid third. You could almost get millennials creeping up into almost their 40s. Yes. See, that's older than than I than I would have imagined, just because of the way that um, people who aren't that much older than that are complaining about millennials. Right. When they take digs at millennials mm -hmm. and the idea that somehow that they're the ruination of. Um, you know yeah. their attitudes and how that yeah so it's just it, it's weird to me i just wanted to point that out because we never got to it interesting and did you watch the oscars on the weekend uh no not at all okay so i i don't know how, so i should give you a bit of background there's so the the movie that won the the best film oscar so this was mm -hmm. what as an aggregate the pe the members of the academy decided was the best movie of the year yeah. was green book mm. and so the green book was this um, travel book, travel guide that somebody named Green wrote as a summary of all the different places. It originally started off as across America that were friendly or, yeah, friendly that w w would be willing to take black uh, travelers. Oh, interesting. Right. So the story itself was about a, uh, it was a, a, you know, one of those buddy uh road trip movies yeah. where there was a piano player who was black mm. who was being driven around by this uh italian american guy who was a little bit of a bigot oh and i think, I, I think I've, South... I've seen like um i've seen the trailer for this or some stuff from it okay so the point i, I wanted to make was i'm watching the the <clears throat> the speech the acceptance speech yeah. thanking everybody and it was uh one of the Ferrelli brothers you know the guys who did some you know like something about mary yeah Maybe, are uh, you too young for that i am <laughs> okay. okay so it just it's just that one of those like uh cheap um silly kind of humor movies right like mm -hmm. almost gross out a little bit mm. but the point was that in the speech what was ridiculous to me was so they're they're thanking everybody and the one thing they do is they, you know, they, the, the guy he singles out is thank you to Vigo Morgan. What's his last name? How do you pronounce his last name? The, you know, the Aragorn from Lord of the Rings. I have no clue. Vigo Mortensen? He said, we, this movie couldn't have been made without him. And then as, after he said it, like maybe a moment later, he said, oh, and Mahershala Ali and Linda Cardellini. And, you know, Mahershala was actually the guy who won his Best Supporting Actor for the mm. Green Book. And yeah. it seemed like an afterthought. And to me, it was funny. And, you know, normally you, you, it feels like almost you're playing the race card a bit because there's mostly white guys on the stage. Yeah. They He, he decides to thank the, the white guy first. And it is the story told a little bit from His the driver's experience. Yeah. Right. Um, which is more an issue with the source material than it is with the movie. Mm. However, they didn't thank Shirley who's the piano player. They didn't think that, you know, the movie's also about him. He's yeah. sort of the, the co-main character. Mm -hmm. And it didn't thank Green, who wrote the Green Book that the movie was named after, mm. which is a weird kind of a mission, right? Well, I mean, 
I guess for the, the what the movie was named after, it depends on how much it was actually related to that sort of as the source material. It just seems, you know, you know what I mean, though. Like mm-hmm. usually, when you have something that's based on something, it's important yeah. enough to name the movie after it. Yeah. It's one of the two main characters. You know, if it, what they really should have done was thank the the writer's dad, who mm. was the original driver that they based it on, mm. and thank the piano player and the guy who wrote the Green Book, which was sort yeah. of the basis of the idea that the underlying idea that during this time it was not safe for people who were not white to travel in certain areas. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a that's a not bad point. I think one one thing that I did see from the Oscars is um, Rami Malek won, right? For uh, yes, Mr. Robot. Yeah, uh, he won for uh, playing Freddy. He mean Rhapsody. Yeah, yeah. So that was interesting. I think uh, I watched a video of his speech and it seemed pretty, uh, pretty cool. All right, you know who is hilarious? Olivia Coleman. Not familiar. She, okay, I, I I don't know who she is. Mm. Um. But she was. She just gave like a really good speech, which is kind of funny. All right, so the idea to me is they didn't have a, a, a host this year, right? Yeah, I, and it I seemed heard like it was supposed that. to be a big deal. But it's. I, I think this to me it went a lot better because I don't watch it for the host. Sometimes the, the the production numbers are interesting, but most of the time they're tedious. And you wait for those moments, like when Olivia Coleman uh, gives her speech, and she's just. It seems like she's just genuinely happy to be there mm-hmm. and getting the uh, award, and that she's just funny too. See, I didn't see that. I'll have to. I'll have to maybe look that up after this. Yeah. Uh, so it was interesting. I think this was actually more successful. It finished in a decent amount of time, like three, just over three hours instead of four hours. And it was, and uh, I got a chance to watch Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga perform "Shallow," which was mm. my my vote. I mean, I didn't watch a lot of movies, but that, was, that had my vote for the favorite song, and it won. Yeah. Um. There was this morning in my uh, or not this morning. Uh, yesterday it was. Um in my uh psych lecture uh they my my professor played a song from a star is born i i recognized it as the one that you showed me oh okay what all right so you know and maybe we're getting way too far in the weeds we're gonna get to injustice eventually for anybody who else is mm-hmm. listening but I, this is a chance to get caught up with you so what i love about shallow is it not only does it sound good which it does but when you listen to the lyrics a little bit there's something just almost painful where they're each singing to each other and you know, one of the the lines in each of the the recurring parts is so um, when things something I'm gonna paraphrase. I can't remember without the tune. Mm-hmm. But when things are good, I find myself longing for change. When things yeah. are going good, so that you know they're just unhappy enough that even yeah. when things are good, they just want change for the sake of change. And but when things are going bad, mm-hmm. they fear themselves. They're mm-hmm. like they're that self destructive that they can't be happy. And to me, that's very. Um, I don't know. It's very tragic. Yeah. Where people just can't be happy. And when it's good enough that they just can't be satisfied. And when it's really bad that they're just a danger to themselves. Mm. Mm. That is poignant. Yeah. Okay. And so- I'm, I'm not a big fan of Lady Gaga actually until now. And I, I, I was really impressed with her in that movie. I, Did you see it? No, I haven't seen it yet. Okay. I recommend that. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll I'll probably have to give that a watch at some point then. Yeah, I don't think I'm specifically a fan of Lady Gaga either. Although to be fair, I gotta say I don't actually know particularly much about her as an artist, other than just sort of you hear her songs pretty frequently, right? I think it's pretty hard to escape sort of her, it um music and pop, but I have no clue about anything other than her stuff that's gotten like a lot of radio play, basically. Right. And that's the way the music's changed too, right? There's not really the same sort of top 40 pop anymore where there's uh, a few songs that get a huge amount of play. I think it's fragmented a lot, right? Yeah. Maybe in the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years. Because I still remember listening to Chum FM top 40 list. There's the Chum FM top 40 album list and Chum AM top 40 singles list. Mm. And that was so way before your time. Yeah. Yeah. So then maybe maybe you should get to the first question, which is also not injustice related. It's should we just follow-up. should we pick an injustice question first to start with it? It's just so that uh, we can maintain the maintain the facade that we're actually doing it. That's true. Q&A. But then we have to start with the injustice question and not talk about injustice, I think, because that's we have one. OK, so why don't we do that? Okay. Okay. Our first question comes from Ben Payne, and they say, "I haven't got many gold characters. They are Prison Superman, Red Sun Solomon Grundy, Blackest Night Hawk Girl, Insurgency Batman, and Joker, and Normal Black Adam Gold. Are there any teams you suggest or tips that would help me?" 
and this is a good question because it's sort of broad. It's interesting a little bit because it's the 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 strategy I think has evolved over time. Yeah. Um, and it really depends a lot because back it, when I sorry, go ahead. We've we kind of talk around our strategy for a lot of this stuff a lot, and we do kind of talk in more detail every time people ask us. But uh, in our, like our weekly recaps, for example, oftentimes when we're talking about the packs, we'll sort of allude to our general strategy of accruing characters, especially. Uh, without kind of ever explicitly going step kind of by step and explaining what we what we tend to do yes that's right I mean, it's probably not reasonable to expect people to watch all our mp videos because i think we touch on all the things and if you you know it's 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 a bit of a cliche where when people who produce content say that you, we've really revealed ourselves and what we do but i think we have at least as far as injustice goes because mm. we've talked about everything i think it's just at this point there's what like hours and hours to uh slog through if you want to really get sense but i think we've we've laid it all out mm -hmm. pretty clearly and originally the game didn't it there was only one mode right a single player mode yeah. so it didn't used to be the answer didn't used to be it depends yeah it just used to be pretty straightforward and there also um weren't a lot of uh team packs so there was a very limited uh number of ways and they would be up for a very long time to get uh, uh a guaranteed set of three characters so for building your teams it was pretty kind of straightforward and there was really only one thing to buy which was packs right for characters you'd max out the characters you promote the characters and that strategy still holds pretty good if we're talking only single player mm -hmm. mode because that's what there was mm -hmm. Um, so just get max out whatever characters you want, whatever you like to play. It doesn't even matter if there's synergy or not. Yeah. If you get them to level, it used to be level 40, elite 5. Now it's level 50, elite 7. Mm. and Or maybe for some people, level 60, elite 10. You get yeah. them to 50 and 7. And then you just motor yourself your way through yeah. in single player mode. Mm -hmm. But I get it gets a little bit complicated because now that we've got all this other stuff going on, I think the qualifier for single player mode is max out the guys that you don't care about as much, that you don't think you're going to want to play multiplayer as much, because multiplayer has actually changed it. Mm -hmm. And and we, I think we've talked enough at in not too long ago about uh, this to not maybe rehash the exact same ground, but just basically the idea is that there's battle points, right? And there's there, the things that you need to consider are battle points and matchmaking and gear. And so you need to sort of match your gear with the level of... Uh, your guys otherwise you're going to be fighting at a disadvantage you also have the opportunity to be fighting at an advantage by having your gear better than the average gear of people at your level um and then there's also taking into account battle points for a sort of efficiency of play where if two teams take the same amount of time but one team has better stats you have the opportunity to kind of earn more battle points and that just makes every kind of minute you spend every unit time you spend playing a little bit more efficient getting you more battle points right and I, I think you've summed it up really well. i think i think that's like the basic basic for how you want to organize your sort of multiplayer play and then um something else that's important to note is augmentations because in the same way that um you know gear can give you sort of a boost uh over your opponent so can uh crit augmentations specifically so and that hasn't changed where mm -hmm. the crit chance and the crit damage augmentations are probably the most important of the two because the damage and health uh boosts Mm -hmm. will change the matchmaking algorithm. Yeah. And you don't want to give yourself more health or more damage that's actually going to make your opponents harder. Yeah, and so, I mean, if we're just looking at this person specifically, if you look at how many characters does he have? Uh, one, two, three, four, five? Is that five or... Yeah. One, two, three... Yep, six, yeah. six. Okay, sorry, six. So six gold characters. This is a point where you might still want to be buying a couple more discount gold packs, but you also probably want to start saving um, and looking for a targeted team pack, even if you're not going to get them fully eluded, uh, to right. just get them up to, you know, a kind of higher standard of quality, Elite 3, Elite 4, Elite 5, whatever you can basically afford. So I would say maybe buy a couple more discount gold packs if you're feeling it, depending on how much you're playing. If you're not playing that much, uh, you can start saving up. But if um, that's if you're not playing that much and you're planning on the long haul, if you're not playing that much and it seems like this game is going to be a little bit more short term, really, I guess at that point you you know spend money however you feel like it in your short term gains. So you're probably going to want to focus on getting a team up, 
and that's both for single player and multiplayer. You don't need to get them too high, but you need them a couple elite levels so that they can actually be kind of a good cohesive unit. Um, and then you're going to oh. want to like kind of balance how much you're spending on gear too. Okay, so this team that we actually have is a good example of some of those principles. So they are all elite five only, level yeah. 10, or sorry, level 50, I mean, and they could be higher, but one, we don't need them to be higher because they're still getting maximum battle points already. So the only advantage of increasing them would be if we could get to the point where um, the opponents couldn't be any stronger than us. Yeah, so they couldn't scale up so the later fights would not be any more difficult. Except it also means that we are more likely to be facing a team that has Astro Harness, and that always slows down mm -hmm. the fights. So you be if you're grinding for points, for example, you get as many points, and you could potentially face teams that aren't stronger than you, the way we're facing teams that are significantly stronger than us now. But we'd yeah. also be facing more Astro Harness, and then the fights would just take longer as a, as a matter of course. Yeah. There's nothing we could do about that. Mm -hmm. And th they're all... Uh, well, maybe not all. I can't remember what the numbers are. We could probably see it when the, with the next in between the battle. But we've maxed out the gears that we're using to give us the best advantage of it. And they all have max crit. So it's 450. Yeah, they're all 450s, right? Yeah. Um, and we've maxed out their crit chance and crit damage without increasing their um, health or uh, attack. Yeah. So there we go. I think Should one... we summarize it, maybe? Um... Like just to, to get the points, we ramble a little bit, right? Yeah, I, I think one more thing before we even summarize it is um, if you're saving up, I would say a decent way, especially if you don't have all the support cards yet to sort of keep yourself interested and engaged and still purchasing stuff is to every once in a while actually buy some bronze packs because that's a good opportunity Ooh. to uh, snap up some support cards. It's very cheap once you consider selling it back if you either want to sell back the bronze uh, or if you want to sell back the support cards if you already have them. So that's a decent way of you know, kind of giving yourself little, uh, little boosts in your purchasing every once in a while. Little bits uh, of joy, because sometimes if you if there's nothing better than the feeling where you spend only eight thousand credits and you get a support card that you can sell back for ten or thirty thousand credits. Yeah, and I would say you could do a similar thing with gear because gear is sort of a long term investment. Uh, but the, I think one of the problems is, is that gear feels sort of I think a little bit dinky. Um, actually, for the amount of money that you put in just compared to characters until you've got a pretty robust roster, I feel like. Because, yeah. uh, especially just because of the way that gear is, it fundamentally feels better when you have a lot of different people to put it on. So you can start kind mm -hmm. of, it feels like it has a much wider sort of range of use. Whereas if you only have a couple good characters, um, even your use of gear is pretty restrictive. And I mean, if you don't have that much gear yet, you also have to take into account like unlocking gear slots and all that. You right. know, so there's um yeah. there's a lot of sort of early uh depending on where you're at in it with six golds i think it's fair to say that you're decently early in the game there's a lot of kind of juggling and there's a ton of money to be spent in different stuff and it's more for this i think than anything else an issue of making sure that if you're playing multiplayer um the ways that you're getting better are kind of balanced as far as gear augmentations um characters right and not just individual characters but characters in relation to each other that stuff is all a little bit more of a delicate balance especially if you're starting out right oh yeah for sure um oh we actually have a couple videos with uh teams that can be bought directly from the store with gears that are only available that are available uh sorry that are available in the gear locker so mm -hmm. i wasn't good i didn't want to say only they are available in gear locker in other places but they are accessible even if you don't rank on multiplayer or have survivor working for you. Yeah. So I think I think that is. Did you want to do the summary then? Yeah. Or all right. So let me go. What, what did we go over? So we went over. Um, if you're just interested in clearing single player and grinding for credits and bonus battle six, all you really need to do is pick anybody, max max them out. Yeah. And either via team pack or in the store. Yeah. But if you want to. Um, have a team and if you want to have a team that's going to be able to do that a targeted team is team pack is the best because you get the best deal where you get three characters uh usually for a cheap price and instead of buying the gold packs which is the next best thing to give you um grinding fodder but they give you a team that's going to be strong enough to get to and a uh, clear bonus battle six repeatedly yeah and then uh if you have aspirations to multiplayer and we why wouldn't you because they have cool characters and legendary gears um focus on maxing out crit 
damage and crit chance to give you an advantage in the fights without actually making the matches any harder mm-hmm. and get gears because they will offer another advantage every all the other augmentations and stuff that you can put on characters will end up making the matches actually harder either because of the stats of the characters you're facing or because of the gear load that the, the other characters are facing yeah that you're facing um, okay. Did we miss anything in summary? That was it, right? Uh, yeah, I, I think that was. I think that was pretty much everything. I think you know what? I think that's close enough. I think if somebody is actively listening all the way through, they will have gotten what they needed to from that discussion. Uh, ideally, okay. uh, <laughs> maybe take notes <laughs> if what we're saying is really that uh, important. But uh, I somehow doubt it. I think I think people would be good. So our next question, and I want to say actually, I, I quite like this question because it's sort of. Um, showing us that somebody's actively listening and engaging and also not just sort of nodding along but um, mm-hmm. looking at it thinking about what we're saying um, so Darth Pucci comments confirmation is usually at 15 to my understanding alright so when when Darth Pucci wrote this it made me actually take a look around because uh, you know clearly um, one of the mistakes that people make and I just made it here is that you assume that you're own personal experience is uh universal not so much universal but applicable to everybody else like you know it's not you know what i mean like that you think oh so if it happened to me i guess it is that's literally what it means but it's more just thinking that you know this happens this is pretty typical you are trying to generalize a single case study's worth of data to an entire population and so my experience was so i was actually i i was raised in in uh a, a Catholic environment. I went to church. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went to Catholic grade school. There was a mm-hmm. time in between where I went to a specialized, <coughs> excuse me, uh, high school that was not so. And it was one of those high schools that started in middle school, sort mm-hmm. of, not really. It started in grade seven instead of grade nine, like the way it does in Canada typically. So grade seven was when I was supposed to be confirmed, and yeah. I was not. And then when I ended up uh, sticking with that school, but going back to Catholic school in grade 10, mm-hmm. around grade nine, before I realized I was going to go back into Catholic school, I ended up getting confirmed and I had to take special courses at church to make sure I knew what I was doing, mm. which is weird, sort yeah. of. I mean, you know, grade seven, grade, sorry, grade nine, mm. typically you're 14. Yeah. At the time I was 12. So I think I was probably less capable than I could have or should have been in order to make an affirmation mm-hmm. of my um, Catholic faith at the time. Yeah. And so I, I, I did a little bit of research. Okay, so um, there diff- depends on where you are, but you can be confirmed as young as seven years old or as old as 16. Mm-hmm. Or I guess you can get confirmed any age, but really. Yeah, but traditionally the, like the typical, you're confirmed around... Yeah. So yeah. that, that range is where, you know, certain sort of, um, it's not just where it never happens. It's this is how they've got systems set up to have a large group of kids confirmed at anywhere from 7 to 16. Yeah. So um, in, I found an example. So there's a Michigan diocese that does it at grade two. So all the grade twos in Catholic schools do it at seven. Ohio found one that does it at grade five. In Toronto, and I don't know, I, I, I mean, they're pretty easy to find. I guess I could put the links in the description, but Toronto, grade seven is typical, so 12 years old. Mm-hmm. And I found, all right, so I don't know whether this is a legit newspaper or not, but there's an, something called the National Catholic Register. Mm-hmm. They have an article about conflicting views on the age to confirm. Mm. So this is a thing. This is like a controversy. and Which is interesting. So, all right, so I've got a little thing. Do you mind if I just read a, a clip? Um, yeah, no problem. Just to give uh, an excerpt. So is is seven too young or is 16 too old? Is there a universal age when one is ready to be confirmed? Um, in the Eastern Rite and Eastern Orthodox churches, babies receive baptism, confirmation, and first communion all at the same time. The Western mm. church broke from this practice in the 4th century. The 10 diocese, U.S. diocese, dioceses, dioceses, uh, with a restored order. Restored order, I guess, meaning, you know, babies get all of it at once. Um, mm. Phoenix, Tyler, Texas, Gaylord, Michigan, Marquette, Michigan, Fargo, North Dakota, Spokane, Washington, Portland, Maine, Great Falls, Billings, uh, Montana, Greensburg, Pennsylvania, and Saginaw, Michigan. Oh, so there's a lot of representation from Michigan. 
Mm. Um, and the Catechism of the Catholic Church says that confirmation is necessary for the completion of baptismal grace, and that baptismal grace doesn't need ratification to become effective. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I think that definitely is an interesting and important conversation to have. And I think one of the the reasons why it's an important conversation to have is it doesn't sort of, it doesn't matter that much to the people who are, no, I shouldn't say that much because that's a personal thing. I can't actually speak on behalf of people, but it won't matter as much to people who um, uh, like confirm, right? Um, uh, is, con- is confirm appropriate? Uh, or they stay of... confirmed because confirmation is the actual sacrament. So yeah. these are people who end up not only confirmed, but afterwards they stay with the church. Yeah, because th- those are the people who it actually matters to what age you start it. Because uh, the problem is if you're if you're not if you're actually later kind of going back on it or not necessarily going back on it if you change your viewpoint. Um, as like a, a ritual or a rite of passage, it sort of loses its significance if you're no longer ascribing to the system of belief that had you do it, right? So this is yeah. sort of a more important conversation for um, kind of people who are actually staying in the faith. And so for the to the kind of people that the conversation matters to, it almost seems like uh, it would be just you'd be just as well served having it uh, later, right? And it's it's really a question of when it's sort of. Uh, relevant and how much it how important it is that uh the person is making a sort of uh decision that you that at least people can perceive to be one that they have been like had an opportunity to research and think about right and kind of come to their own conclusions on separate from their uh in all likelihood family right yeah i just want to point out for the people who maybe are still actually watching that last fight was a perfect example of why this team is so powerful where arkham knight batgirl had a bunch of power and we were able to do specials with wonder woman until she ran out drop in aquaman and do more specials with him and knock out arkham knight batgirl before she even had a chance to use that power she'd accumulated Mm. so this is anyway sorry um yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. But what's funny is the way we're having the conversation, there's an underlying assumption, of, at least, about what confirmation means. And what was interesting in the article was that they actually talked about it in uh, f- with a framework that part of the reason why they have this uh, sort of dispute is that you can look at confirmation as one of two ways. Either it's a blessing on the person who's receiving it because then they, you know, you're completing the uh what they call completion of baptismal grace yeah so that means you will not go to hell if you die yeah um as opposed to confirmation is something that's meant to give strength to the people who are receiving it so that it can help them in times of difficulty which adolescence is Mm. so i mean it's just interesting right so that the there's these conflicting kind of drives one is to get it done as soon as possible so that it can help them through difficult times and one is to do it as late as possible so that people understand what they're getting themselves into so that they're actually making a conscious effort yeah and so that their i don't know salvation i guess is is legitimate yeah okay does that make sense yeah no that is that is uh that does make sense that's interesting yeah, and I never really realized, it. I mean, which is funny because I went through this and it mm-hmm. was a big deal at the time. And it's, I guess it's at an age where um, maybe it makes sense because you'd think that it gives you a little bit of guidance and yeah. a little bit of help and support for a time when you need it. But the problem, I think, is that because you're so young, instead of necessarily being helpful, it it becomes almost a little bit of a kind of indoctrination where you're really supposed to accept this almost uncritically and you're young enough that you don't really have the critical faculties to make it work the same way that you do with you know ideas that you understand and adopt when you're older yeah uh okay i think that's maybe (laughs) it for that yeah all right so can i ask you something though yeah do you you, do you think do you regret not having grown up with a, a faith like because you've got friends who yeah. are religious yeah for sure and they they probably have at least a slightly different outlook on life uh yeah they can uh i think for a lot of my friends sort who are religious are sort of religious in a very casual uh way where it's more of like um 
they're used to it and there's certain aspects of life that they are either um under religion that they're they're either used to and fine with continuing or they find comforting uh especially sort of with that establishment of like a of purpose or kind of greater right. meaning that's a perfect word comfort yeah right so so this is there is value in it mm-hmm. and I, I remember this because all right so your grandmother my mother yeah was catholic and yeah. devoutly catholic mm-hmm. and when she was dying it gave her a lot of comfort yeah. to know that she had her faith that god was waiting for her yeah. that there is a heaven and a hell mm-hmm. so does it do you wish you had that kind of comfort I mean, if we'd raise you Catholic, there's the, I mean, there's obviously possibility, right? That not, it's no guarantee, but there's a chance that you would have found that kind of comfort when you had difficult times. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a mixed bag. I think it definitely, um, I think there's something to be said for it. And uh, it's, it's, it would be hard for me to honestly say, you know what I mean? Like, cause it's, it's not just one kind of individual thing right because a lot of organized religion um has tenets about ways to live and some which are just more sort of uh general rules for comporting yourself which i think oftentimes uh are pretty decent as guides yeah and then, but you can have that replaced with secular kind of beliefs too, exactly right? and then there's often some more specific stuff that tends to be kind of less parsable in a sense of just like oh this is just uh, an aspect of behavior and tend to be closer to this is specifically like a kind of religious trapping, right? Where it has more to do with um, like specifically the religion than it is kind of more generally like a guide for how to live, right? Right. Um, like ceremonies and rituals and stuff like that, which don't kind of have any inherent um, justification outside of sort of religious belief, right? Right. But um, there is that familiarity like you're talking about, right? Because when you yeah. have that ritual, it just makes it easier to get into that, the mindset, I guess. Yeah. And it makes you connected as a community because these are just all things that you do together. If you didn't do anything together, it would be harder, I think, right? Yeah. And so, like, honestly, honestly, I couldn't tell you. Um, I think, <laughs> I mean, just from uh, the most utilitarian perspective, it, yeah, you're right, it would be comforting. And uh, on the flip side, it would definitely take a non-zero amount of time, right? So those are, that's kind of the, right. I think, at the most basic level, um, those are kind of two things that would be true of sort of, I think, almost any uh religious faith right is like those those Mm -hmm. are like no almost no matter what there's certain ways that you have to uh live there's a certain sort of commitment of time or effort mental energy of some kind but there is also a certain degree of comfort and i honestly just because i don't like that's not my lived experience i don't think i know enough to be able to you know say definitively uh whether that would be you know preferable or not well i i was imagining it'd be more like you know if you um had friends who had i don't know like a really big screen tv and you got to visit them you saw the big screen tv and you think oh i wish i had that uh, you know like more like that than you know that you could know that this is absolutely something that was missing in your life just that you see your friends who are religious who have faith who go to church or uh sh- or uh a mosque or um w- synagogue i'm yeah. trying to, I, I was gonna think shul shul is not right it's synagogue hmm. um or have like um a bar mitzvah or something right yeah. that i wonder if if well no i just wondered if if you maybe wished you'd had a little bit of that experience mm, i don't know i don't think i've ever felt particularly lacking uh because of that or uh necessarily like jealous of that i think i've i've been pretty like okay and good with that oh somebody's calling you no nope, nobody's calling me that's just <laughs> i forgot to turn my phone on do not disturb yeah it's just it's, it's interesting though because it's i know that organizer religion gets a bad rap sometimes for some of the things that they do right that people do in the name of organizer oh i was just watching a series of videos um about censorship and, you know, they talk a lot about the USSR, but also the Spanish Inquisition, mm. which I think was based on religion, too. And it's just interesting, a lot of stuff that people do at, with re, uh, their faith or religion as a justification for it. But I, that that's the bad rap part. But I think when when we talk about it, at least when atheists talk about it, uh, that the, the, the thing that gets missed is how much of a community mm. uh, 
organized religion can be so that you don't need to invest that same kind of time every time or all the every time you go somewhere new or meet new people to create a community if there's already one set up with the same kind of structure so that when you go to another church in a different country you might not speak the language you might not know the people but there's a structure to the rituals that helps you mm. assimilate yeah or find your people to find your community yeah uh, like like a lot of other things especially a lot of things that are very important parts of people's lives it turns out that it's pretty complicated and nuanced and entrenched in a lot of different aspects uh of that person's life <laughs> well it, it'd be like this right so it's the same reason why we go i mean it's not even like the, there's if there were more social events with injustice players but <laughs> as an example if we were to bump into people who play injustice that would be sort of a a, a common point of interest right? or that's true going to science yeah. fiction conventions right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is what we like to do because you meet people who ha already have this uh common interest and think how much more powerful it is when your common interest becomes a matter of faith and just this thing that you do every single week that's a yeah part and it's, of your it's life. like intrinsically tied to lifestyle and core values and everything else yeah so it'd be sort of like the injustice community but on steroids right or no, like yeah like a lot of different like yeah like fan communities but it, you're fans of uh whatever uh higher power you believe in right yeah because it's funny because i mean it, it is kind of funny and it's kind of not it's part of the reason why w there, there is at least a bit of community whether it's the forums or whether it's the comments in, in on our channel and stuff mm. just that even this common interest is enough to make some connections between people I mean, they're not, they're, they're a lot more tenuous, obviously. Than, than organized religion. Yeah, I would say so. Right. But it's that, it's that almost social need, but injustice, I mean, when it's not organized religion, it's a bit more interesting when you don't actually have to see people because, mm -hmm. um, there's in, in some ways it's easier and there's a lot less pressure for people who maybe, uh, don't perform so well in person. Mm. Yeah. I think, I think that's, that's totally true. How did we get here? Oh, it was a question. Never mind. I was just thinking, how did we end up in this whole? I don't know. We we went some places. Do we wanna yeah. Do we wanna move on to our uh, next question? Yeah, I, I guess so. It's just funny because we we never. I don't think we've ever talked about religion before, really. Yeah, I don't. I think you've mentioned it in passing, but you're right. Like sort of, kind of out and out fully. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So well, we, yeah. Our next yeah, question. thank you very much, actually, um, Darth Pucci. That's a funny name um, for for bringing this up. Actually, I, I like that. It was um, it was kind of cool. Yeah. So our next question, or I guess this is more of like there's like some there is a question embedded in it, but there's a kind of comment and a little bit of a discussion first. This is from Jared Lopez. This is a follow up to our discussion on uh, abortion, mm -hmm. and. They say, hey guys, I just wanted to respond to your response of my comment. You guys had some interesting points, definitely gave me quite a bit to think about. I agree I should have used the term human life instead of life. From what I could gather from your response, it would seem that you guys believe that the fetus is not yet human. It is important to define the term human and what we mean by it. Personally, I like Aristotle's definition of a human, um, a rational political animal rational referring to the spirit slash soul slash mind political referring to community and animal referring to the physical body castello mentioned that the fetus is not a capable being while the fetus is dependent on the mother for survival infants and even children are also dependent on their parents for their survival uh food clothing shelter uh, my question is what distinguishes a fetus from an infant or a child? It would seem to me that the only difference is the stage of development in which they are in. The fetus or even the zygote would seem to be the earliest stages of human life. Mm. Um, I guess I have some deeper things to say, but first, I guess, uh, I think rational might be a little bit too harsh a definition. It might not seem that way. Yeah. And I think that's maybe a little bit too strict because there's lots of people, I think, that aren't necessarily rational, but definitely their life, I I would value higher than that of say an animal or a plant. Mm. Yeah, and and I think one of the problems uh, with this discussion is that we run into is that there's like levels, the like we're we're kind of defining. Um, because we're defining humans as kind of fundamentally other or separate or inherently more valuable, um, we kind of have to 
look at why we do that and what our criteria for that is in and of itself. And I, cause I think to some extent, the reason why we're doing that, um, is a sort of selfishness and, you know, like people will talk about like, especially like animal rights activists, right. We'll talk about how it's uh, kind of our definitions are just flexible enough to kind of fit our needs. Um, and more justified after the fact than specifically being based off of, uh, what we perceive to be, you know, like, are kind of what our value um our values are and what our kind of fundamental framework for thinking about so you mean um, like stuff? utilitarian kind of values like they, they work they're very practical yeah so i i think i think in a lot of cases we kind of work backwards from what we already believe oh so, for sure all the time yeah so like it's your gut reaction then you try to justify it after so for for stuff like this i think that's one of the reasons this conversation is really difficult to have because um you know, what would be the earliest stages of human life is I think a lot of people have sort of an intuition and then work backwards from there. So it's going to be a little bit hard because there's a lot of different ways that you can, there's a lot of different axes. There's a lot of different um, kind of pieces of information that you can draw on to uh, make your definition. And they're all sort of, uh, which one you pick is based off of both like how much you know uh, so if you right. know more or less about different like aspects of the biology and science and d like human development, right? Um, you might be able to you m might have access to different arguments or different um, information to uh, prove your point or disprove somebody else's. But it also matters what you I think what your knee jerk reaction is and what you believe for where you actually look for that justification. Yeah, no, that's that's perfect because you touched on the thing that intuition is it, right? Yeah, and intuition I believe. All that is is a gestalt of all of your previous experiences and all those different times that you've made a decision and all your the stories that you've heard about things and mm. you put it all together and it's in this box, you shove something in it and it pops something out mm -hmm. and sometimes that result is right. If you've had a breadth of experience and you've yeah. seen a lot of stuff and you've thought about a lot of stuff, but then it, your intuition can often be wrong mm -hmm. if you just don't know enough. Yeah, and, and I think there's also a balance between, um, like, emotional versus uh, purely kind of logical motivation, because I think, um, you know, I, but I think moving too far in either direction actually has some, some failings or a purely kind of logical uh, utilitarian decision. We actually talked about utilitarianism over uh, reading week is a pretty incomplete philosophy because it really kind of erodes um, most kind of most human rights um mm -hmm. so uh i think like in discussions of stuff like abortion as in anything else taking a completely utilitarian approach is uh wrong and kind of conflicts with our uh, everyday beliefs but so i think too would a completely emotional sort of perspective be incomplete in that it would not really take into account any sort of science or like, it, it would be pretty divorced from, like, actual reality, you know, it would just be how people felt about stuff. And so I right. think I think that's one of the other reasons why this is a really difficult sort of conversation to have one way or another. I think a lot of cases it's just people sort of sharing their own opinions <laughs> and other mm -hmm. people going um, either, no, you're wrong, and this is why, or I see where you're coming from, but this is my opinion. Um, and it feels like, I think, definitely to me and probably to a lot of people, um, when you're sharing your own opinions, um, even if your opinion is incomplete or you agree that there's sort of like a range of opinions that's acceptable to have, there's the idea that you're kind of circling around what is an objective truth. And um, even if your opinion isn't exactly what that objective truth is, it is based off of or derived from or closely related to what the objective truth is. Okay, so this is part of the reason why I like having these conversations with you because there's something that just occurred to me that I had not thought about before and I'm going to try to express it and I'm going to apologize if I screw it up. Yeah. But it feels... All right, so the way you're describing it made me think, so the way we come to opinions, the opinions are the sort of the hardened part mm. and it's all the stories and our experiences that lead us to these opinions. It's almost like there's some sort of like a, a gel or something and you put it all together and you shape it and then over time it gets a little bit crusty. And that crusty <laughs> shape... No, that crusty shape, you know, on the outside, it forms a shell. Yeah, and it's okay. that crusty shape on the outside that you're engaging with with other people when you say, this is my opinion, this is my opinion. 
And if you engaged at a different stage where instead of going to the crusty part, <laughs> you started with the, the, the gel part where, you know, the stories and the experiences and you were yeah. able to share that those stories and experiences more effectively and saying, this is what I believe. This is why it's right. Instead, talk about, so this is what my experience was and this is what led me to thinking mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. And there is a much more, um, there's a greater potential there for actually changing people's opinions maybe i mean that shouldn't necessarily be the goal but at least get them to sort of understand mm -hmm. your perspective and why you feel a certain way and there's probably the best chance of changing somebody's mind because getting it you know starting off with the crusty stuff and banging against each other with your shells doesn't yeah. actually get you anywhere but when you're ready when you're at that stage where you're molding things yeah for sure Oh, can I, can I point out, I mean, it was a couple of fights ago and we were sort of in the, the thick of it. I didn't want to interrupt, but what's interesting to me in this fight is it seems like Luchador's Bane, Luchador Bane's um, stun on Tagen, which if it stuns, it does a point of damage. Yeah. That when you're facing somebody that has the um, the shield from Astro Harness, yeah. even when the shield is not nothing, if their health is down to nothing, the Tagen with the stun is enough to knock them out. Mm. So they don't get the benefit of the last bit of the shield. I saw that in a couple fights just now, and I might have to look back at the footage to see it. But I think that it's interesting. I never noticed that before. That's interesting. Yeah, we'll we'll have to we'll have to check that out. Um, yeah, and I I think I think one of, I mean we're we're talking less about kind of directly answering the question of where we personally define uh, the dis like, the difference like where, kind of abortion becomes unacceptable because it turns from a question of. Um, like pure kind of bio biology and mechanical processes to one which is inherently like an ethical and moral question. Um, and I think one of the reasons why it's very hard is because um, like, you know, human development is a really kind of, uh, it, it's a very sliding scale spectrum sort of process. And so uh, I think a lot of people uh, who don't believe that you know life begins at conception believe that there is a point where it is okay and there is a point where it is not okay but exactly where that point is i think is really really hard to determine uh and it, i think it almost has to come down to a certain um personal kind of ideal um in a lot of cases because uh you know i think i think there's like no matter what kind of the science says at the end of the day um you, you have to use the science to inform stuff but you know i think a lot of people will use a lot more emotional cues right where some the idea of like uh for example a, a fetus kicking right would be mm. would be seen as uh probably pretty a pretty significant stage uh to most people and uh you know stuff like that is probably right. um and i i would argue for, like probably rightly a little overpowering right that sort and it of should emotional be. I mean, yeah that's where you make the connection right yeah. and it's not there's nothing wrong with that i don't know that you can disagree you know you can't say that's the, that experience is wrong it's not that yeah. it's wrong it's that there's still i guess other conflicting kind of stories and information mm -hmm. so it, can i maybe it, you said we weren't going to get too much in it but i do want to address one specific point because i think um jared was saying uh, while a fetus is dependent on the mother for survival, infants and even children are also dependent upon their parents for their survival, mm -hmm. food, clothing, shelter. My question is what distinguishes a fetus from an infant or a child? And the one thing I want to say about that specifically, because they, in my mind, they're very different because a, an infant or children can be raised by many different adults as long as they're motivated, right? That's true. So, they can be raised by almost any third party. And I mean, they don't even have to be, although they should be, uh, raised by adults. Oh, yeah. that's. Right. <laughs> I guess that's true. Um, <laughs> they, they can be raised by other entities or parties. That's true. Um, usually not as successfully. Yeah. Um, just because they don't have the right resources or the, the experience. But the difference is that fetus is completely dependent on this one particular person and will die without this one particular person or and i think the you're using the term die here again um where we well it's life careful. right it's not necessarily yeah. human life but it is life so this life will end even if it's i mean if you're going to use a definition of rational which i'm not but there's whatever that ineffable part that 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 ineffable kind of thing that distinguishes life from human life yeah is um will not be possible without this one particular person that is incubating this life mm -hmm. to the point where it becomes viable 
Yeah, and I think I think one kind of uh, way that we tend to measure stuff, which is one argument that is um, for humans and not I don't want to say against animals, but sort of gets to conveniently leave out animals, is um, the discussion of like potential, um, where you can mm-hmm. talk about like you you um, kind of weigh the value of human life or you weigh the value of life based off of what it has the potential to do so that's why you can uh do things to a gorilla that you couldn't do to a two-year-old even if um the gorilla knows sign language and as it turns out the gorilla and the two-year-old are operating at pretty similar levels of cognition um but i i think i think see this is a problem is i i like i think any one theory uh, or any one way of looking at it is kind of is gonna turn out to be a pretty incomplete one so it's really hard and I think on, on a fundamental level I just I I know I've spent time thinking about this issue I don't know if I'm informed enough just from a pure like knowledge standpoint to be able to um, even pretend that my opinion is going to be more accurate or um, more valid than um, I think like who I would hope to and expect to be like the policy makers well all right so this is funny there is a whole discipline and the word i forgot last time during the last podcast thing was it was department right so that they were talking mm-hmm. when we were talking about linguistics and that, that, that you can't create a whole department out of thin air just because a movie came that's what i was thinking of so there's used to be a whole department of philosophy like whole discipline of philosophy where um the only requisite was that you had experience thinking yeah and so the, I think the idea that we there's actually um, like hard knowledge that it like you know absolute kind of truths. I mean, it's not really because the whole idea of the scientific method is that you can test hypothesis and it's testable and failable. Yeah. Even if it's true, mm-hmm. it just doesn't fail. That there's certain ideas that we've tested for so long that it would be like a, a huge paradigm shift to say that they're wrong. But there's certain things that we believe, right? Yeah. And so these. Um, Oh, what the hell was was I doing with this? That these ideas that it used to be that you didn't actually have to have a lot of knowledge. You could just think a lot, and if you could be convincing, you could be a philosopher. Mm. I think that's still true to some extent. <laughs> I mean, we have examples of that, right? We've got those, yeah. you know, basically demagogues. Anybody who's willing to say something and they can say it convincingly. Um, and I'm not looking at any particular professors who happen to be based in Toronto. And as long as they've got an audience, then they will have a voice and they will have maybe a disproportionate kind of influence on um society yeah it's funny i was um i was actually watching a video about uh no particular professor who's based out of toronto um <laughs> to uh today um, so i sort of i sort of brushed up on my um <laughs> on my on my knowledge of that uh non particular professor uh, who who may or not be uh, previously a professor of uh, University of Toronto? That's right. You're there. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> we, we have we have a very tenuous but real connection. Man on the inside. Um, yeah. All right. So and, and you were saying? Um, did you was there anything interesting about that? Uh, no. It was uh, it was a video uh, by Contrapoints, uh, a, a YouTuber that I I quite like, and it was just an interesting breakdown of how. Uh, his philosophy sort of um, doesn't have a very solid base and that's one of the reasons why it's so widely digestible is that like the actual sort of fundamentals of um, his worldview are pretty sort of broad and vague and academic sounding and not super um, rooted in concrete definition which makes it really difficult to sort of pin him down and it makes a lot of people kind of see what they want to see in his right. discussions so it works both ways because it means more people can connect with it but then it also makes it harder to disagree with it because you're not really disagreeing with something specific yeah yeah exactly and it's it's easy to kind of when when other people try to pin down your argument and say so are you saying this because that's wrong um it's a it's sort of an easy tactic to say no that's not what i'm saying right um which makes it yeah, really read hard. the context you're missing the context read everything else read hours of video or watch hours of video um and it, it that makes it really difficult um and so anyways contrapoints contrapoints youtube video on jordan peterson is uh very good 
Oh, I don't don't you mean no specific? Um, That's true. Um, Contrapoints is YouTube video <laughs> on uh, a professor of uh, psychology from uh, who who or no spe- no specific professor of psychology. This has become very unwieldy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so th- this is another example where I probably don't actually have anything near as interesting uh, to say as the people who have actually put a lot more time and thought and right. research into these topics. And, and their timing is actually pretty good. I think we've we've squeezed the last drop of interest out of that, and we've got only one more fight left. you want to maybe talk through the fight? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, so what's the, interesting is... <laughs> to sorry, the detriment what? of our podcast listeners. Yeah, they can always come back to this. So we've got, we're facing uh, Raven who's going to have a bar power because of Razzle Scimitar. So there's the danger of triggering her uh, passive, which swaps her health. And then we've got to worry about uh, the tag in from Ares if he's got two bars of power. And um, uh, Cassandra King Batgirl, who will do damage on tag in. And the idea here was to let Raven use up her bar power. And once she's lost that bar power, we can hope that the special two, which it just did now, is enough from... Uh, Bane is enough to knock her out and bypass her passive mm. and each time Bane does not knock somebody out it's easy peasy to tag in back roll to do a special one to soften up uh, the teammates on the opponents that haven't taken uh, haven't tagged in yet and just take away a bunch of their health and now yeah. there's just really nothing because mm. she's gonna oh oh she was probably geared for a special one but we don't really need very much because she's the only one left yeah so there we go oh not quite sorry there we almost go yeah that's okay her special uh, hot girl special two is pretty good oh i never noticed that well she's got a very bad hunch when she's starting her special two Mm. a hot girl it's it's gotta be not very good for her neck I don't know why that just occurred to me she should have better posture if she's gonna be smacking somebody with her mace um, and so, that brings us to the end. <laughs> there we go. To, yeah. To uh, finish up, uh, we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash bdckr, or clicking on our icon in the bottom right corner at the end of this video. But as always, it's uh, much more important to us that we give recognition to the people who have already made the plunge and decided to support us. And uh, for quite a few of these people, they've been supporting us for actually a very long time time and that's been really really cool to see uh we we mentioned it a lot more when we were starting out but we weren't actually expecting a huge amount with the patreon this was more of sort of an experiment in the um in how youtube worked just because this was like another method um or sorry not a method another aspect of um content creation that we Mm. saw a lot of other people doing and um we kind of reached a size where we figured we could do it on a very small scale and what um we thought would be like a kind of minuscule scale turned out to just be a kind of minor scale which was um cool to cool to see so um to uh a huge thank you to all the people that surprised us by uh supporting us that's console peasant eddie g and edwin felix who are supporting us at the highest last word tier we have i profit i profit three on youtube who is supporting us at the your message here tier sean farrell and daniel simonson who are supporting us on the credited level and laszlo Jajadas and chris wolf supporting us on the gratitude tier which when we were starting out we were pretty sure uh a buck a month from people was probably as much as the we limit? could have uh, expected, <laughs> the most? Yeah, yeah, as much as we could have expected from uh, a very small handful of people. So thank you guys all so much for your support, and and of course thank you to all of you just for uh, you know listening, watching, just for consuming our content. Um, we'll see you guys next time. Komoda. Komoda.